was interesting because at the first service, I told everyone that it had been one year, six months, and nine days since I've preached. I can't say that now because it's only been an hour and a half, but <laughs> it gives you the idea. Um, I'd like to start this morning by reading the scripture. When uh, I talked to Tammy, I just said, send me uh, Pastor Harley's scripture and sermon and I'll see what I can put together. And the scripture that he had chosen comes from Zephaniah in the Old Testament, the prophet. And he's, uh, we're reading from the third chapter, verses 14 and 15. And Zephaniah speaking for God says, Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exalt with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away all judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst, and you, you shall never again fear evil. Would you pray with me? Father God, we understand that throughout this world there are people who live in fear for a variety of reasons. They fear in life. They have fear for their lives. They have fear for taking care of their families. They have fear for expressing their faith. And Lord, we ask that you will pour out your grace and your mercy and love on everyone, giving them peace and helping to resolve the fear that is so prevalent. We give this to you in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. I'd like to begin this morning by asking you a question, actually two questions. The first question is, what is your greatest fear? Think about that a minute. And the second one is sort of like it. What is your worst nightmare? Now, a lot of us, when we think about those kind of questions, we kind of hold them close to our hearts. And so the next one question I would ask is, what if you had to reveal that thought, that fear or nightmare to someone that you don't really trust or don't know if you could trust? Back when I first was in the process of becoming a pastor, there's this whole process that you have to go through and one of the things that you have to endure, I guess you could say, is a psych, eva psych evaluation. And they send you this paperwork with two or three pages of stuff to fill out. And one of the questions was, what are you most afraid of? And I looked at that paper and I thought, this paper is going to someone I don't know. And I'm not sure I want to share that with them. And so I left it blank. And when it came time for me to meet with a psychologist, and we were going through the questionnaire, she came to that and she said, I notice here that you didn't write anything down. I said, that's right, because I'm not sure it's any of your business. And I thought, you know, that's the way I feel. I don't know where this is going, but here I am now some 17 years later, and 15 of that was spent as a pastor, so I guess it really didn't matter. But it mattered to me because there's some things like that that you just don't want to share. So, thinking about those thoughts though, what if your worst fear or nightmare came true? What are you the most afraid of, really? Are you worried that the worst could happen? or that somebody might find out about it. You know, when studies have been done on fear and they've discovered that Christians have similar fears to everyone else, we still have struggles and we still worry about things even though we know we're not supposed to. In our reading today, our reading from Zephaniah, it talks about the end of an era where a nightmare had overtaken the nation of Israel. The people of Israel had endured over a hundred years of bad sinful kings, 
The country had been taken over by the Assyrians who had brought with them all their own religion and their own statues and their own idols and their own gods. They had installed them in places of worship, finally even invading the temple in Jerusalem, all with the approval, unfortunately, of the Israelite kings who were following along. Kings like Ahaz and Hezekiah, Manasseh and Ammon. And the people kind of bought into this whole program and they engaged in all manner of evil and despicable acts. The worship of the Ammonite god Molech even demanded human sacrifice. Manasseh got so involved with the program that he burned his own son to death to honor Molech. And throughout this period, the Assyrians held a pretty strong hand over the daily lives of the Israelites. And because of the way that they sort of blended politics and religion, things were not really good for the common people. Fear of evil had worked its way into society and was rampant. After generations of this evil rule, King Amon was killed and his young son, nine-year-old Josiah, was placed on the throne. And apparently there was in Israel a remnant of true believers and they came and they offered assistance to Josiah and the boy king began to get rid of the statues and the gods and all the stuff that had infected Israel and began to clean things up. After about 10 years, he decided he needed to restore the temple in Israel, I mean in Jerusalem. And so they began a rebuilding project and in the process they tore down a wall and discovered a book. And it was the book of law, probably the, the, what we call the book of Deuteronomy. And they pulled the book out and he had it verified that it was true and real and he called the people of Israel together and they read it in their presence. Now, the people began to return to God, began to understand that this was where they needed to be. And this part of the book of, Jer of uh, Zephaniah that we read focuses on the, the needs of the people of God to live in righteousness, to live in a connection with God where they were right with God. A people, he said, who do not respect the needs of the oppressed and care for genuine worship before God will not long prosper. And at that point in time, Israel was pretty much in ruin. So that point of his prophecy had rung true. Now Zephaniah preached that about the day of the Lord and the impending judgment of God. Zephaniah also believed, however, in the sovereignty of God to preserve the remnant that remained. If you look at this time, you'll realize that a lot of the problems that Israel was suffering through were placed on them by God, who had grown weary of their sinfulness. And as I was reading through this and some of the notes that I gathered together, I thought, you know, unfortunately, that's the way I think a lot of people see God, mighty powerful, ready to, to use an Old Testament term, smite us down whenever we do bad things. They see him as vengeful and ready to, to, to make sure we know our limitations and the depth of our sinfulness and depravity. They believe in God. They know God's up there somewhere, but they think he's separated from us by who knows how far, busy doing his own things, even though he smacks us around once in a while when we do bad things. But how could he ever from that far away truly understand my problems? And what's interesting about this group, I think, from conversations I've had as a pastor, is what does God have in mind for me when I die? It's been shown that in the list of top 10 things people fear, death is always in there, sometimes up, sometimes down. And it's interesting that 
when they do these studies that Christians actually don't fall that far below non-Christians in looking at death. It's interesting, isn't it? When you look at this top 10 things, we fear death along with snakes, heights. Some people even fear clowns, although I've seen some pretty scary clowns out there. But isn't it interesting? We teach it, we preach it, we say we believe it, we listen to it, and still the promise of everlasting life doesn't always really soften the blow when we think about our own demise. We trust that God is loving and caring and forgiving, but, you know, still we worry. Back before I came into the ministry, I was attending the uh, Hanover Ridge United Methodist Church up out of Sayo, and I got to, my wife and I got to know the pastor there, Bruce Zimmerman, and his wife, Doris. And at one point in time, Doris had a very bad medical condition, ended up in the Caddis Hospital, and my wife and I went, Carolyn, went down to see her. And while we were visiting her, she said, you know, it's interesting. Yesterday morning, I had a situation where I almost died and I was scared to death. She said, I've had a day to reflect on that now and I'm amazed, because she was a woman of faith. Let me tell you, she was a woman of faith. And she said, I just don't understand where that fear came from. Now she made it through that, she lived for several more years and as I, wasn't, I had gone in the ministry and wasn't there when she finally passed away, but I understand that she died with a smile on her face comfortable in the knowledge of where she was going. But sometimes we just have to get there, and it's not always easy. But what a blessing it is to know people who do that. I've, as a pastor, I've been with several people at death's door who smiled and were almost excited. One lady said, well, how will I know when it's time? Another gentleman was, had cancer and as he was at death's door, I was visiting him in the hospital with his family and the doctor came in and he had a breathing tube in and he couldn't talk and the nurse said, do you understand what's going on? And he said, yes. And he said, she said, do you need anything? And he said, no. And she said, are you all right? And he just looked up to heaven and pointed. Now what's a blessing about that is about four or five months before that, God blessed me being a part of bringing that man to Christ. It's amazing what you can do when you have Christ in your heart. But those who see God as vengeful and angry, fear holds a completely different potential. They see death as that point when they end up before the judgment seat and Jesus is sitting there pointing his finger at them, reciting the litany of all the sins in great detail before the saints who went before them who are sitting there going and wondering how you ever even got there. They see God as ready to just get down on them. And I've known people like that. I don't know, have you ever found yourself feeling like that? Wondering where you're gonna turn? What's going on? That maybe you've done too much, gone too far, nothing you can do? Well, let's go back to Zephaniah for a moment. Our reading from Zephaniah chapter three especially when we look at verse 14, is a reflection of how Israel eventually turned away from their sinfulness following this period of being just totally depraved. Following the example of the young king Josiah, they returned to God in faith and worship. And look at what, speaking for God, look at what Joseph, Zephaniah, too many prophets, Zephaniah says, he said, we need to sing, we need to shout, dance, exalt God. When he comes to us and he comes back to renew this relationship with us, this is something to get excited about. And God recognized their humble return to, to their faithfulness and he spoke through Zephaniah, announcing the restoration of his, of his relationship with these people. It was a total change from when evil was the rule of the day. But in this, this faithful remnant that was still there, 
understood that God truly was in charge and that one day he truly would reward their faithfulness. So when Zephaniah spoke God's words of restoration, he declared that God had overcome evil and the evil no longer needed to be feared. And I think that this story is important to us here today for a variety of reasons. To begin with, despite their sinful past, God had never given up on the Israelites. And despite their sinful past, God had never stopped loving them. And finally, when the people repented and turned back to God, Okay, there we go. And finally, when the people repented and turned back to God, he welcomed them with open arms and because that's who God is. And what he did for those people 2,600 years ago or so, he still is willing to do for us today. Because you see, just like the Israelites, despite anything that we may have done that or may have occurred in our lives, God never gives up on us. And it doesn't matter what our sinful past looks like, God never stopped loving us. And finally, if we, like the Israelites, repent and turn back to God, He will welcome us too back with open arms. And I'm a living, breathing example of this fact. When I was in my late teens, early 20s, it wasn't a pretty sight, folks. I was doing things and going places and engaging in things I shouldn't have had anything to do with. When I look back at that time, I'm still surprised that several times I didn't actually end up in jail. It was not pretty. And somehow through it all, I was gently urged and nudged back through God's spirit. And finally, I attended a weekend called the Via de Cristo. I was raised Lutheran, and the Via de Cristo is the Lutheran version of Walk to Emmaus. How many of you may have gone on a Walk to Emmaus? And on the course of that weekend, I got the proverbial spiritual two by four across the forehead. And out of that, I felt a call to ministry and God taught me a new lesson. It was six years before I was actually called by the Methodist church to come into the ministry. So I also had to learn a little bit of patience about that. And I look at this and I say, well, if God can do that for me, he can do that for any of you as well. Because no matter what you've done or where you've been, God is faithful. That's who and what God is, and God has said that, and God cannot lie. So you can trust it. No matter how alone you feel, God's still there. He's still waiting. He still wants you to come back. He's ready to call you back. I doubt any of you have done anything if you feel unworthy that compares to anything the Israelites did during that hundred year period under the Assyrians. And yet God still loved them. You see, God is not looking for revenge. He's not looking to get angry and get even. What he wants to do, he's looking to heal. And he's looking to restore. And he's looking to bring you back to a loving relationship with himself. Even the most sinful person listening to this sermon, whomever that might be, can trust that. That's how much God loves us. He really does. I like Psalms 103, and I'm looking at verses 8 through 12 as a beautiful example of this. The psalmist writes, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse, nor will he keep his anger forever. And then it starts getting interesting. He does not deal with us according to our sins or repay us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his love 
toward those who fear him. And as far as the, and I can't remember which way is east and west in here, as far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our transgressions from us. Back when I was, uh, years ago I was doing a children's message and I had a pad of paper and I took and wrote the word sin all over a piece of paper. And I said, now imagine this, this is all the bad things you've ever done. Can anybody think of any bad things you've done? And they all raised their hands. And I said, how would you like to have to stand before Jesus and have him point all those things out to you? And I took and I said, watch this. And I ripped the paper off and I wadded it up and I threw it over my shoulder. I said, now what do you see? A blank paper. I said, yes. And when you trust in Jesus Christ and your sins are forgiven, they're removed. And that's what you show up in heaven with, a blank piece of paper. Your sins are removed. That's the beauty of it. So I want you to listen to this little truth. God is not the one pointing his finger at us. He's not the one accusing at us, accusing us. God is not the one who is gleefully waiting the time when he can just lay waste to our lives. That is the work of Satan. He's the one who rejoices in our guilt and shame, not God. Satan is the one who is constantly reminding us of our issues and our problems and pouring out guilt on us and reminding us of our transgressions. Several years ago, I did a sermon. In that sermon, Amy, you'll remember this one, my good friend Amy, who came this morning. I said, we tend to carry around with us a guilt bucket. And what is a good day if you don't have a little bit of guilt? And so whenever things get too good, you can always get a handful and just drop it down and just get the day back right again, right? And then when things go wrong, you can get a couple of good handfuls and say, well, it's all my fault anyway. Then when you have a really bad day, you can just take the whole bucket and just dump it down on you. Hallelujah. The problem is, even though you think it's empty, Satan's there filling it up again. He's the one who keeps the bucket full. But Jesus offers us another option. The apostle Paul discovered this truth. Now apparently, Paul, for all that he was and writing letters that fill like 80% of the New Testament and talking about being good and righteous and wonderful, still had a few problems. Listen to what he tells us in Romans chapter 7, verses 21 through 8-2. He says, I have discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what's right, I inevitably do what's wrong. Am I the only person in here that has that problem now and again? He says, I love God's law with all my heart, but there's another power within me that's at war with my mind, this power that makes me a slave to sin that is still within me. And I've sort of felt this next verse so close. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Where's my guilt bucket? Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? And then he says, "Uh uh-uh, listen to this, folks. Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So you see how it is, Paul writes, in my mind I really want to obey God's law, but because of my sinful nature I am still sometimes a nature to the sin that wanders around in my mind and everywhere. And then you come to chapter 8, verse 1. If you happen to have an issue and you're struggling with, you're afraid God's coming to get you, listen to these words. So now there is no condemnation for those who believe in Christ Jesus, who believe and belong to Christ Jesus. We no longer have to fear the judgment seat because Jesus has already taken care of that for us. And because, Paul writes, that you belong to him, the power of this life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. So, you see, no matter how much the world excludes you, 
for who you are or maybe for what you've done or where you've been or left done or left undone or for a thousand other reasons that people tend to exclude us. All God cares about is for you to open up your heart and your soul and your life to his wonderful and amazing grace. We're going to sing about that in a minute, right? Yeah, his wonderful and amazing grace. It really is easy to succumb to the world's finger pointing and walk around with our guilt buckets. But that's not who God is. You see, God was so desperate to make sure that you had the resources available to overcome the evil with which Satan constantly bombards us that he sent his only son to die on the cross. That's what John 3.16 tells us. He loved us, he gave his only son, and if we believe in him, we will not perish but have everlasting life. Now, many of you have, may have read author Max Licato, a pastor who wrote many books, and I've got a little quote here from a book he wrote called He Chose the Nails, where he talks about what we receive from Christ on the cross. It's a wonderful Lenten book. He writes, as boldly as the center beam reaching from earth to heaven declares God's holiness, the cross beam declares his love. And oh, how wide his love reaches. He writes, aren't you glad that the verse does not read, for God so, so loved the rich, or for God so loved the famous, or for God so loved, I like this one, the thin, not my problem. It doesn't. It doesn't. Nor does it state, for God so loved the Europeans or Africans or the sober or successful or the young or the old. No, he writes, when we read John 3.16, we simply and happily read, for God so loved the world. How wide is God's love? Wide enough for the whole world. Are you included in the world? Then you're included in God's love. I thought, what a wonderful thing to look at. But then we can go back to chapter 3 and continue with verse 17. I love this. Sort of echoes what Paul wrote about there's no condemnation, because this is what Jesus told Nicodemus and which he shares with us. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. What a blessing this is. What a wonderful thing it is to know that God has provided us with the means. He provides the love, and he stands ready to heal and to cleanse and to wipe away that guilt, to just get rid of the bucket once and for all. I still keep mine around just for good measure. And get rid of the shame that we've carried with us all too long. But how do we do this? I'm glad you asked. You see, when I came up to Ohio, we were living in North Carolina when I did the Via de Cristo. When I came up here, became a pastor and got involved with the Walk to Emmaus movement and did several weekends working as a pastor. And this one weekend I did, uh, there was a time when there was a young member of the team who was talking to an older gentleman, we called them pilgrims, the people who were making the weekend the first time. And he came to me and he said, this guy is just talking and I don't know what to tell him. And I said, okay, let me see what I can do. So I walked over and this gentleman, he had a clear focus on that verse in Psalms or Proverbs, wherever it is that says, spare the rod and spoil the child. And I think that one verse pretty much dictated his faith. And he was very strict with his kids, and he was very strict with his wife, and he was in his 70, and his wife was getting upset with him, and his children were beginning to pull away from him, and he just didn't understand it because he was doing his best, and he talk, told them about Jesus, and he just didn't understand why they didn't understand. And I have no idea where it came from. But I looked at him, I said, and I don't, I'm not going to give you his real name, I'll make up a name, Bob. I said... Have you ever personally and intentionally asked Jesus Christ to come into your life as your Lord and Savior? 
He's, he did one of those double takes. He said, well, no, I haven't. And I said, well, would you like to do that now? And he did another double take and he said, yeah. So together we prayed a, some version of what's known as the sinner's prayer. And he accepted Jesus Christ. And when we got through, he sat there and he looked at me and he said, Pastor Allen, I think I need to just go back to my room and think about this a little bit. Now, there's a saying that if you do a walk to a weekend, a walk to Emmaus weekend, when you come home, you're walking on air for about three or four days till the reality of the world catches back up with you and you come crashing back down. I saw this gentleman two months later, he was still walking on air. I mean, I met his wife and she was all smiles. I think, what a change that can come when you just invite Jesus Christ into your life. Because it's a healing, it's a loving, it's a caring, and it's real. And so what I'd like to do here this morning, I don't know you folks well enough to know where you're at or what you're doing on your own faith walk. But let me ask you the question. Have you ever personally and intentionally asked Jesus Christ to come into your life as your Lord and Savior? Now, if you honestly and truly haven't done that, you can answer no quickly. Although it's a little more confusing if you've been a Christian all your life and you've been to church and Sunday school and studied. But I'm not asking you if you know about Jesus. I'm asking you if you know Jesus. And if you can answer that question, no, or even I'm not sure, then I ask you the same question I asked Bob that night. Would you like to do it now? And maybe, maybe you have accepted Jesus and maybe you just need a little renewal here. I'm gonna offer up a prayer. It's my own version, like I said, of the sinner's prayer. And I'm going to invite you to pray with me. I'll offer a part and you just respond back. You can do it out loud. You can whisper it. You can even do it in your own mind. And for you folks who are at home, who may be watching this on your TVs or your computers, I invite you to join us as well. And after that, I've got a special video I've asked the AV people to show. And I just want you to sit in your pews and just let the words soak in and then when that video is over and then the the uh our praise band will come back up and close us with our final song so if you'll close your eyes and just open up your hearts and pray with me father god i've got a lot of problems i know i'm a sinner and I know I'm not near as close to you as I need to be. God, I ask you through the blood of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross to forgive all my sins. Fill my heart with peace. Wipe away the guilt and shame and let me know your love for the first time. And now, dear Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart, to be my Lord and Savior, today and through eternity. Dear Jesus, I am yours, and you are mine. And I ask that this covenant we have made would be ratified here on earth as well into heaven and carry me safely home to eternity with you. I give you thanks, God, because you love me so much. In this name of this Jesus who is now mine, I pray. Amen. And if you wish...